So hi everyone. Um, thank you to everyone who's taken the time to learn more about plastic reduction measures in school cafeterias. And I'd also love to give a quick thank you to our presenters for their time as well. We're all very excited to hear from them today. My name is Isabella Garcia. I'm the food program manager at the Center for Environmental Health as part of the food program team. The overarching goal of my team is to remove harmful chemicals of concern from food packaging products. Part of this work has been partnering with school districts to help facilitate the move towards non-toxic reusable food and serviceware. And our most recent achievement has been working with uh, the Albany Unified School District in California to get a dishwasher installed. We're so excited to partner with Cafeteria Culture today to present this webinar. So with that, I want to introduce Jenny Davis. She's a physician and environmental attorney at the public um, and the Public and Environmental Health Director for Cafeteria Culture, which is an environmental education nonprofit at the forefront of school cafeteria plastic reduction. Thank you, Bella, and Center for Environmental Health and the Urban School Food Alliance are partners in the battle against school cafeteria plastics. So why are we here? I think you all know schools serve 7.35 billion meals a year, and it's not uncommon now to find seven to 10 single-use plastics in a single meal, both packaging and foodware. So schools are adding billions of plastics to the plastics waste stream, and those plastics, as we know, are with us forever. But worse, schools are unknowingly repeatedly exposing stu students to thousands of toxic plastic chemicals, more than 13,000 chemicals used to make plastic, most of them unknown and untested. They include neurotoxic heavy metals like antimony and lead and persistent organic pollutants, including thousands of endocrine disrupting chemicals. And in the last two years, we have learned that these chemicals readily migrate from plastic food contact materials into food. But even worse, I think, we're training students, we're training an entire generation to eat individually wrapped food portions and to eat from throwaway containers with throwaway utensils and straws. And finally, one last point I want to mention is that plastic, both packaging and foodware, is strongly correlated, and we have emerging data from several sources now, that, that the plastic is strongly correlated to student food waste. So for all of these reasons, reducing school cafeteria plastic is an environmental and public health imperative. Think of this as a battle on two fronts. We got your plastic packaging and we got your plastic foodware. And that's actually good news because that means there's a lot of starting point, points, a lot of um, entry points and way to attack this problem. And the other good news, we can have a big impact on this problem by addressing large volume uh, procurement patterns. And that's why food directors are key to this movement. Um, we're thrilled to have two trailblazing uh, food directors uh, leading this uh, webinar today. First, Dr. Katie Wilson, Executive Director of the Urban School Food Alliance, represents food directors in the 18 largest school districts in the country, and she's going to discuss plastic packaging changes. And then we'll have Johannes Vanderpool. He's the uh, Child Nutrition Services Director from Fremont, California, a mid-sized district, and he's going to talk about reusable foodware and making packaging changes from a smaller district's perspective. So we'll begin with Dr. Katie Wilson. Uh, her, pa her passion, of course, is child nutrition. She's dedicated her career to getting healthy food to children and their families. And before taking the lead at the Urban School Food Alliance, Dr. Katie spent 23 years as a school nutrition director, five years as executive director of the Institute of Child Nutrition, uh, two years as the USDA Deputy Undersecretary of Food, Nutrition, and Consumer Services in the Obama administration. She is a frequent invited guest and academic speaker here and abroad. She served 34, uh, on the 31st Standing Committee at the UN, the Standing Committee on Nutrition. She holds a Bachelor's of Science in Dietetics, a Master's in Food Science and Nutrition, and a Doctoral Degree in Food Service and Lodging Management. I don't know how she's done all this stuff. <laughs> she's credentialed as a school nutrition specialist and has received many peer nominated awards, including one named after her, the Dr. Katie Wilson Lifetime Achievement Award. She is no doubt uh, one of the uh, country's and maybe the world's top experts in the field of child nutrition. She's gonna uh, lead us off with talking about uh, packaging changes. Great, thank you so much for that kind introduction. Um, and let me just quick get this going here. 
I am delighted to be here, Jenny. I appreciate it uh, to be here and speak to all of you. And thank you all for joining this webinar because I think this is a really important topic for us to begin to discuss and start thinking about how we can play a role in what I call finding solutions. It's always really easy for us to say, well, it's just too hard for us to do. I have too much to do. I'm too small of a school district. I'm too large of a school district. I don't know how else to find these products. I don't know what else to do to, to change the way things are packaged. But I think that when you think about school meals, we're the largest restaurant in the country. And a lot of us buy exactly the same things from coast to coast. So the power of what we have to change things and to find solutions is incredible if we all take a role in doing the best we can. Now, I really am appreciative of this partnership with Cafeteria Culture. We started a couple of years ago. And, you know, the, a lot of the districts in the Urban School Food Alliance have already been doing a lot of things to, to remove plastic. A really good example is one of our districts spent 18 months just trying to get the plastic straw out of their cutlery kit. Now, that might seem like, oh, well, it's just a little plastic straw. But when you think of the millions of cutlery kits they buy each year, that plastic straw was a lot. And to get it out of that cutlery kit, even though they ordered that volume, took 18 months. But it was persistence. It was constantly thinking we've got to be able to do this and to use the power of our own work um, here in the district that we can do this. So this partnership with Cafeteria Culture has been really good for us because we've really raised the bar and awareness of the kind of plastic that we're using in the back of the house and the front of the house in school, in school meals. And then for the Center for Environmental Health, joining in with this webinar, we also appreciate knowing what their resources are and how much they're caring about this same topic and that they can help us through this process. The Urban School Food Alliance, uh, like Jenny said, is a collection of the largest school nutrition directors in the country. They have to have 50,000 enrolled or larger. Uh, and we're a membership-based uh, nonprofit organization, so it's volunteer that they come together to find solutions in all sorts of ways. But our mission is to use our collective voice to transform school meals. And so to begin to think about how can we reduce plastic in the way we procure food is a really good place for us to start thinking about using that collective voice to transform school meals. And so let me give you a couple of ideas on how we do that. These are all pictures of my own. Um, this is my dog. I just wanted to sort of put a little humor into this to think about a very, very dear friend of mine who was a school nutrition director here in Wisconsin. I'm based in Wisconsin. I was a school nutrition director in a very small district of only 1700 for most of my career. But she was a neighboring district director and we became very good friends. Her mother just turned 98 years old. And they, we were having a discussion the other day about waste baskets and waste. And she said to us, you know, we never had a waste basket in our home because we never bought anything that was ripped. We would go and get food from the different vendors in the, in the town or the city. They lived out in the country, they were farmers. We might go into town and get food, but it would be wrapped in paper or that we would reuse, or we would bring our own cloth, flour sack type dish cloths, and that's what we would wrap our food in to bring it home. So we didn't have waste baskets. And so we had this really interesting conversation about waste and how this has just happened within the last, um, you know, the last couple of, of our, own, our own doing. So I thought this was an interesting picture because here's my dog uh, hunting for pheasant, um, the fish we get off the Mississippi River that we eat here in our home, and then the community garden that my son started down in Madison, Wisconsin, right down in the middle of the city, about two blocks from the Capitol, a very populated area. This was a lot that was sitting there in his neighborhood. So he went to the city and said, please, can we use this lot? We'll clean it up. We'll, we'll create a garden. And I think this is exactly where we start when we think about packaging for food. We have to start with better partnerships. Who do we talk to if we want to reduce the amount of plastic we're using in our procurement? We have to have some conversations with the people we're buying food from. We have to have some conversations from the manufacturers of those food, letting them know what is it we're looking for? Why is this important to us? Because we need to find out who those partners are going to be. Without partners, it doesn't work. 
And so starting to have that conversation and think about things is one of the very first uh, beginnings of that. And then we have to commit to the partnership. So if we decide on a product that we think to ourselves, we don't need individually wrapped, we could perhaps do this in bulk, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute, then we have to commit to buying it that way. We have to commit to writing a specification on our bid that says that you do not want individually wrapped. It is not substitutable by individually wrapped food. So we have to start thinking about that. You can also challenge the people you're buying the food from the manufacturers, even the distributors, if they're repackaging for you. Is there a way to put compostable uh, uh, products in the even the bulk boxes? Can you use compostable uh, bags instead of those uh, plastic bags? Now, of course, they have to be food grade. Uh, but are we getting there? Could we kind of force the issue? If we start asking those questions, we can start beginning to get that mindset in people's uh, a pattern of thinking and begin to rethink and reset. How do we bow for school meals? How do we serve on our lines in school meals? Because the back of the house in procurement is the same uh, thing to think about in the sense of how much saran wrap do you use? in a day. And I know you have to work with your health departments, but does a banana really need to be wrapped? I've seen bananas wrapped. Is that necessary? Why are we doing some of the practices we're doing? I know when I was a school nutrition director, it was easy to grab that roll of saran and just pull it across and put it over a pan instead of going for a lid. Um, these are the things we have to think about when we think about what are we gonna procure. If that saran wrap isn't as readily available, maybe we don't grab it as easily. And so to start to rethink and reset how we do things and how we procure uh, is the beginning of this entire thought process of changing the supply chain and the way we get food. So here's some ways to reduce that I've put together. First of all, looking at your menu, because when in school nutrition, I know we always say everything starts with the menu. And it's the exact same thing with procurement. Uh, we're working on a training right now in, in forecasting and, and procurement and writing bids. And we just talked this morning about starting with the menu. That's where we have to do. We have to begin to think about what's in my menu that I could use a bulk food for. Do I really and truly have to have all this individually wrapped food? Now, some people might say, well, I'm much too small of a district. I can't use all those big boxes of bulk food. Well, I tell you, when I was in a small school district, we did use bulk food, almost always. We very seldom used individually wrapped because we um, would use those bulk foods and then we would have a case and we would put that in our inventory. And then on our menu, because it was a cycle menu, that item came up again. So then we were easily using that open case of bulk foods before it would expire, or before it would become freezer burned or whatever it might be. I know in Dallas, Texas, I have to give a shout out to one of our districts. They wrote a standard operating procedure on how to use open boxes of bulk foods so that it didn't get wasted. It didn't get shoved into the back of the freezer and forgotten about. Um, so there are ways to think about where can you begin to use bulk foods? Now, here's an interesting story I'm gonna quickly tell you. I was in the, at the dentist this morning and my dentist is very interested in all these kinds of things. He's interested in the work I do. He's interested in the environmental work that we do and the way we think about all this. And I was telling him about this webinar and he was telling me how very interested he and his wife are at uh, making sure that they reduce plastic in their own homes. And then I went out into the waiting room and here's a big Keurig machine with all these Keurig plastic um, Feasts and teas. And so I said something to him. He walked me out and I said, oh, well, doctor, you can start right here because maybe we could have a pot of coffee instead of all these little plastic pods. And he laughed and he said, you know what? It starts with us, doesn't it? And I said, absolutely. It starts with us. And so when we start with our own personal choices, it can lend itself better to what we do at work. As I said earlier, having those direct conversations with vendors about your intent to reduce packaging. Ask for their suggestions. I just Every time I go to a food show, and I was just at one in Wisconsin, and it was more of a restaurant food show, and so many people that knew me said, oh, well, this isn't for schools. And I always say, why not? Let me decide that. I'm the one running the school nutrition program. Let me decide that. 
So you would be surprised with some restaurant chains that are demanding less plastic in their packaging and the products are there but they just don't give you the access to them or they don't suggest them to you. So having that conversation about your intent and ask for their suggestions. How can you help me reduce the amount of plastic that you're bringing in the back, my, in the back of, of our doors and into our warehouses? Identify a section in your solicitation about your interest in reducing packaging. You know, that could be part of the percentage of scoring your bids. There's a lot of bid, uh, there's a lot of ways to score a bid and so one of the percentages could be that they introduce pack, they introduce products that have less plastic packaging. And so think about that in your solicitation. You could also reward the vendor that has the best ideas for using reusables or, or even for grab and go. There's so many products out there now that can be reused, including clamshells. So maybe that gives the, that vendor some extra points if they come up with some ideas for you on how to do this. And then give extra value to those items that has the less pl plastic packaging. I think this other one is very important. Train your staff to watch for individually wrapped items that are not necessarily ordered, but substituted by the company. You may put it in your spec that you want a 50 pound or a 30 pound box bulk. And you know what? If you really check some of your invoices and when you're as big as some of the districts that are part of our membership, those Deliveries are going into hundreds and even thousands of schools. And so unless those managers of those kitchens are trained to look at those invoices, or unless there's somebody dedicated to look at those invoices, things could easily be substituted and just missed. You just don't notice it. And so training your staff to really look for that and look for individually wrapped items and then you know either refuse it or else if you have to use it, Bring it in and then really contact that vendor and say, this will never be, this should never happen again. This is not acceptable. So I think also developing that standard operating procedure for food storage that includes the use of reusables instead of the plastic wrap. Um, plastic wrap, I'm not sure how much we just do it out of habit. And it's so easy to do um, because it's so easy to grab and to, and to slip on. So really thinking about those standard operating procedures in procurement and what are you doing to make sure that that begins to reduce what's in the back of that house and what how you order food. So I think we have to look forward boldly and accelerating change in school food procurement. This is the norm. We're used to it. It's easier. We don't want to change it up. Uh, we, you know, we have a lot of other things on our plates to worry about. I know that. I've been in school nutrition almost 40 years. But when I was in my district back in the early 90s, we were thinking about this already. We were thinking about uh, reusables. One of the issues we had is they throw away silverware like crazy. Cutlery was tossed away. Matter of fact, we got the big magnets for the top of the garbage cans. How many of you remember those? And that became a game is to see if they could get the cutlery through the magnet and into the garbage can. So we then began to do things in the school district, in the schools, in encouraging, finding some champions in those schools that would start talking about these issues to students and really started thinking about that. We talked to the cafeteria monitors that said, could somebody please sort of monitor those garbage cans to try to make sure that they, they say something to a child if, the, if that cutlery went in. Another thing we did is we put uh, bus tubs or cutlery containers uh, ahead of the garbage can so that they would take that cutlery off that tray ahead of the uh, garbage can, put it in a bus tub, and then flip that tray. So lots of different things that we did to make sure that uh, we could still continue to use reusables and reduce the amount of plastic that we used. Now, one of the things that we did also is to think about that four ounce plastic cup with a lid. I know it's really hard with canned fruit and applesauce, a lot of different things like that, sauces. Um, it's just easier if a kid grabs that cup and you know that the portion is there. Uh, that's a tough one. But I think with a four ounce scoop in the, in the bulk pan, you can begin also to see what kind of reduction in cost that you have when you're not using so many of those little four ounce cups. So a lot of it is education, but if you can find some champions in your schools, and start small, start with one school, two schools, start that, that kind of that ball rolling, and then start celebrating the success of some of the things that you're doing to reduce that plastic. 
And this is actually a chef who was a, a school nutrition director here in Wisconsin. She became the president of the Wisconsin School Nutrition Association. And I love this quote, and it's good for everything and anything you're doing. This is not the time to force yourself to do the things you always did. It's not working. Accept it and give yourself permission to do it differently. Can you try something different, even though you think that it might not work? You think that it might, you know, uh, be too slow of the that might slow down the line. You don't have the right portion size. When we first put out salad bars in our districts uh, back in the early '90s, and we did self serve with spoodles and scoops, everybody thought, oh, that's going to be a mess. It's going to slow down the line. That's ridiculous. And you know what? For about a week, it did. But after a week, we were in really good shape. These kids go to buffets all over the place. They're used to this kind of thing. And so they definitely can serve themselves. They definitely can do some of this. So really going boldly and thinking this through and again, having those conversations that you can have with those vendors. Okay, so your role. Share your ideas, ideas with colleagues. Do not try to do this alone. No matter what size district you are, you can do this if you band together. Uh, like the district Miami was the one who pulled out that plastic straw out of their cutlery kits. They're big enough to force that issue because they, call, they buy such a volume. But if you band together in small districts, in Western Wisconsin, we always band together. And we shared our ideas and we said, okay, we're all going to put this on our bid. And this is how it's going to read in the spec. And so we did this and we were committed to changing some of our procurement language. And then when they opened our bids, they all said exactly the same thing. And a matter of fact, it got to the point where some vendors would say, really, would you guys just knock it off? Just stop what you're doing. No, because now we've created volume, right? We've created this demand because they're going to produce things that, that the demand is there. They have to sell what they produce. So they're going to produce things that the demand is there. Dispel the myths. Everything does not have to be an individually wrapped plastic. It just doesn't. And so is it, some people say to me, well, it's all clumped together in a box. Well, if it's all clumped together in a box, you have a problem with your vendor because that means it's been thawed and frozen. Because all of these items, when they're frozen in bulk, are quick frozen. They're individually quick frozen. So it shouldn't be bulk jammed together in a box and stuck together. And if it is, there's been a temperature problem. So you need to think about that from a different standpoint. Um, saying, again, like I said at the beginning, well, my district's too small. I can't do that bulk stuff. Yes, you can. On a cycle menu, you can. So think about dispelling those myths well, kids shouldn't touch all this food. They shouldn't handle it. Well, if you have sneeze girl, sneeze guards and tongs, our kids grade K to, through 12 took everything themselves uh, except for the, like the hot item. They would take their own bun with the tongs and then we would put a hamburger or a chicken patty or something on that bun. But even in high school, they took their own items. The hamburger patty, chicken patty, uh, those high school kids got used to doing it and they did do it. So really beginning to think about where are the challenges in my district that causes me not to want to reduce plastic and the amount of wrapping that I'm doing and dispel some of the myths that we're putting out there. And then look in the mirror. I think everything has to start with us. We have to say, how do I start this and then share this information with my colleagues? How do I begin to think through my menu? It all starts with that menu. Look at your menu. What is it you could do going to bulk? What is it? Can you gradually start getting rid of individually wrapped? Some of those, uh, those things that you're just used to buying. Uh, and then again, having those conversations with those vendors to try to push that issue forward. And think about that salad bar, the amount of plastic you're using when you serve uh, the, the four ounce portions of fruits, vegetables, those salads, using a reusable clamshell. We actually did that back in the 90s. They had one back then. And we had a teacher's meal because I was I was mimicking Panera Bread. And the teachers could order ahead of time. And they we had reusable clamshells. And when they brought it back, they got a 25 cent discount on their next the next meal. Well, you should see how many teachers brought it back because they wanted the 25 cent discount on the next meal. And so that was the cost of washing that thing was the 25 cents that, you know, that they, they didn't have to take it home and wash it, but just give it back to us. We'll wash it. And then we would um, give them a discount on their next meal. So looking in the mirror and really thinking about boldly making changes, 
we have to do this. I, I just think plastic is really uh, a nemesis to every one of our health and well-beings. Um, it certainly is for our children. When we find that there's microplastics even in our blood, in some cases, doctors are finding it. As school nutrition folks, as the largest restaurant in the country, we have an obligation to do this. We have an obligation to think this through and decide how do we change this process so that we have a better environment and we bring in better products in our, into our schools where we have less plastic waste in particular. And my favorite saying is this, and I'll leave you with this. If not you, then who? Who do we wait till gets to do this? And if not now, then when? How long are we going to wait to stop using so much plastic in our industry? And I will leave you with that, and I will wait for Q&A. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Kitty, for your presentation. Your experience and insight are invaluable to this movement. All right, up next, our next presenter is Johannes van der Poel, RDN. Um, he is the Director of Child Nutrition Services for the Fremont Unified School District. Johannes has been involved in the K-12 through food service for five years, working as a consultant manager and procurement agent with several Bay Area districts before joining the Fremont Unified School District. We are excited to share that Fremont Unified will have moved 10 schools to reusable foodware by April 22nd and will complete a study this summer in collaboration with the University of California's Nutrition Policy Institute on food waste and food consumption in K-12 schools to determine if students eat more food off reusable trays than disposable ones. With that, I'll turn the mic over to Johannes. All right, thank you, Bella. Uh, good afternoon, my name is Johannes Vanderpool. I am the Director of Child Nutrition Services at Fremont Unified School District, and I'm going to be sharing our reusable story. Uh, we launched our first elementary school reusable one calendar year ago next week, uh, April 17, 2023. Uh, but of course, the planning began many months earlier. So for a quick note about the structure of our school district, we're in Northern California Bay Area, a unified school district with 31,000 students. We have 39 schools in total, plus two early learning centers. We have five middle schools that cook for themselves and five high school central kitchens that prepare for the 29 elementary schools. And critically to this story, we have no large dishwashers. We have a couple of secondaries with some single rack pull downs, uh, not large by any means. So soon after I started here in school year 22-23, I was approached by Ben Schleifer at the Center for Environmental Health. Uh, and the, U, the FUSD recycling coordinator. So the Center for Environmental Health had worked with, with us before in testing for PFAS and some of our serving items. And Ben um, was already working with the recycling coordinator when they came to me with this proposal to replace the compostable molded fiber trays, spork kits, and condiment packs with reusables. And it was a great idea. Uh, plenty of benefits, from, uh, right? Less waste, uh, food presentation is gonna be better less plastic in our environment and in ourselves. The scope that they proposed was five elementary schools. Uh, during lunch service, we would use these. We'd roll these out one month at a time. And by the end of the first school year, uh, last school year, we had three uh, reusable sites in operation. Uh, the next two started early this school year. And since these five went so well, we added five more. Uh, so currently we have five reusable elementary schools with one to go starting probably at the end of this month. So after the proposal, I thought, well, that sounds good. And this is you know, something we should do. I did have a couple of questions. Uh, the first was how much will this cost and how will we wash these things? So we'll start with the latter question first. So we wanted to have reusables but didn't have the means to clean them. Uh, so the Center for Environmental Health introduced us to the concept of dishwashing services. Uh, there were a few in our area but really in the end, there was only one. And luckily this one had a business model that perfectly suited our needs. Uh, this is an organization called DishJoy. It's located across the Bay and they have the capability and capacity to take on a project like this. So California or DishJoy is a California based company. They operate here in the Bay area in Orange County and Los Angeles. They do mostly corporate accounts. And I believe that we were either the first or one of the first school districts to sign up with them. It's pretty straightforward how it works. Uh, we buy enough trays and utensils for two days worth of school meals. Uh, they come nightly and pick up their dirty trays from that day's service, and then they drop off clean days for the next clean trays for the next day's service, and they charge a flat fee per items. 
So in this case, one tray, one fork, and one spoon is all a meal item and gets charged as a flat fee. Uh, in the future, uh, we can add a reusable bowl and a reusable cup. Uh, they will also consider that part of one meal and with the same flat fee will apply for that. So we'll get into the cost in a bit uh, and we realize not everybody uh, would need to use a service like this. If you have elementaries that have their own washing capacity or a big central dishwasher, you know, increasing labor might be the way to go. But for us piloting this program, a dish service made sense, it didn't add any work or take any work away from our union staff, and it didn't require any infrastructure or equipment upgrades at those pilot kitchens. So now that we had picked our dishwashing service, it was time to look at some trays. So part of the idea here was getting away from plastics. So no hard trays uh, or hard plastic trays were an option to consider. So again, Ben from the Center for Environmental Health had samples. We took a look at them. They were all food grade stainless steel, durable, chemical safe. Uh, some of them had utensil dishes in them. Some had light, some were lightweight, noticeably thinner. The ones that we went with are pictured here. These are the Ahimsa trays. And why did we pick them? So firstly, they look nice. I think this picture does a good job of showing how they do look in person. And secondly, they fit our needs. Uh, not a coincidence that they have five dishes in these trays for all our components that we need. So a little after we started, I was in a meeting with someone from another district uh, and they were talking about how their child nutrition department was looking into doing something like this. And they mentioned that they took a while to study the different kinds of trays. Uh, they were looking into things like thermal properties. And I sat there thinking, wow, we didn't even think of thermal properties, let alone conduct any studies on them. You know, did we make a giant mistake here? So when we thought about this, we're thinking all the trays are made of metal. They're all good conductors. If the, if the if they get cold, the food's gonna cool off quick on them. Uh, what we had to do uh, was make sure that the staff wasn't plating too early as they tend to do in a food service environment like the one we have. So before a student groups enter, they plate, uh, which they really shouldn't be doing anyway, and the food will have too much time to cool off. So that was our solution. Uh, we made sure that practice stopped and it didn't really add too much more time to the service. So certainly there's a happy medium between what we did uh, and of course the excessive analysis and delays. So we went fast, you know, kind of telling ourselves this is a pilot program and we'll be learning it uh, as we do it. But certainly knowing the product and service here well enough to explain it to everyone is worth some extra time, uh, but it shouldn't cost the opportunity. So not pictured here are utensils. Uh, we just have regular forks and spoons. Uh, your restaurant supply vendor will certainly know which ones you need. We just needed the napkin dispensers. And then altogether, we were able to you know, get rid of the sport kits that we had been using for many years. So I was recently asked why we didn't just use metal sporks uh, instead of forks and spoons. And really the answer to that is I didn't think of it. Uh, so I'll share that with all of you. But if anyone around the district asked me, I'll say that we wanted the students to have a real experience uh, like they do at home with a real fork and a real spoon. So let's get to the fun part, the costs. The trays, they were each less than seven dollars. Uh, we bought two and a half times the number that we needed because of the dishwashing service. We needed to have a clean set on site while the other set were getting cleaned at their facility. And then we bought a little bit more just in case of loss, uh, which has not been bad for either utensils or for the trays. Uh, the utensils themselves cost about 70 cents each. Uh, you saw in the first slide, there was a Nemco condiment dispenser, the two pump. If you can get them, uh, they're over $400 per pump. So we had one per site. And with those, we can eliminate the single use plastic condiment packets that we have. And lastly, of course, the torque napkin dispensers, those are free. The napkins aren't. Uh, we also bought some rolling tables. Those were expensive. Uh, okay, again, a one-time fee. So let's say all in, after expanding to the 10 school sites, that's 2,400 lunches per day. Uh, the upfront cost was about $60,000. So that's not nothing. That is an upfront commitment. Uh, so now for the big one, for the big cost that we have with this program, it's the Dishjoy cleaning service. And it's 40 cents per meal. So again, that's the tray, the fork, and the spoon. All cost 40 cents to wash. Uh, now we could also add the reusable steel cup and the steel bowl at that same price. Uh, and that would give us more bang for our buck, certainly, but we haven't gotten that far yet. So washing for 10 schools, 180-day school year is about $170,000. But of course, there's cost savings because we don't need to buy these single-use trade utensils anymore. 
saves us about sixty sixty five thousand dollars. So let's say yearly cleaning costs about a hundred thousand. Initial investment sixty thousand for us. But that's not what we paid uh, because we had a lot of help from the organizations that you see on this slide. So in the top left, you see plastic free restaurants. So this is an organization that's a very definition of a nonprofit. Uh, their mission is just to get plastics out of food service, simple as that. They've helped us tremendously. They're donation based nationwide. Uh, so please tell your friends. Uh, since we were getting rid of all our sporks in these pilot schools, they pay for all of our utensils. So there was no cost there. The city of Fremont paid for the majority of our trays. And Stop Waste, which is our county's waste reduction organization, offered a grant, which we were able to get for $50,000. And last but not least, the California Universal Meal Program, where now all the students eat breakfast and lunch for free. Uh, this is the real thing that has allowed us to make so many changes in the last two school years. If you're here in California, you know how amazing and impactful this has been. Our meal counts went from about 8,000 to about 18,000 in one year. Uh, it's been a lot of work, but with the extra revenue, we're able to pursue projects like this. So all in all, after the grant, we'll be best spending about $50,000 this year um, to serve 400,000 lunches with reusables. So $50,000 is a commitment, uh, but to feed the 10 school elementary sites with reusables, it's worth it. Uh, if you have the ability to wash your own dishes, the price will be even better. So one of the key things that I learned here is that there are a lot of people willing to help and not just with well wishes. I mean, they're willing to help with money. You know, city, county, incredible nonprofits like Plastic Free Restaurants, they all stepped in big time to make this happen. So now that the cleaning service and the reusable products and financing had all been sorted, we looked to identify which sites would be best for this pilot. So again, our recycling coordinator had a list of administrators she thought would be best suited. Uh, she knew them from recycling and composting implementation that was done at each of our elementary school sites. We tried to spread the sites out as far across the district as we could, but it was very important to find the right principals. I'm sure that all the elementary school principals would have appreciated having reusables, but this being a pilot program, we looked for those individuals that would really help drive this. So now if you do pursue this reusables and reusable utensils specifically, I can guarantee one thing. Somebody, or in my case, about half a dozen people, when you tell them about your idea of having reusables, they will almost immediately say, what if the students stab each other with forks? So some people just, I guess, jump right to the worst case scenario and work backward from there. I'd be lying if I said it didn't actually cross my mind as well. So and right after they ask that, they'll ask, what if they hit each other with the trays and what if they fling a tray across the cafeteria? So I'm happy to report in one calendar year, none of these things have happened. And I don't expect they will. Uh, the students are used to using forks and knives and plates uh, and they're used to using them properly. So the trays we got, they do have some weight. They're a little bit under a pound, not a big deal for the older elementaries, but of course, the kinders and first graders, it might be a little more challenging. They do get used to it. Uh, I've seen it with my own eyes. Our drop tray count hasn't really increased since we rolled this out. So the final concern I heard from a principal at one of the first sites that rolled out the reusables is she said that people thought she was a crazy, she was crazy for agreeing to it. It's not a radical change, uh, and it's an important change. And I guess there's people out there that you might run into that can't quite visualize it until it happens. So if I could do anything all over again in this whole process, it would probably be the board meeting where I gave a presentation on this reusable pilot program asking for permission. So firstly, we split, split the approval for the Dishoy washing service contract and the presentation. So they were two different agenda items. That was a big mistake. The service contract we pit, put under the consent items and it was mixed with a bunch of other consent items uh, from other departments. So the board in closed session decided to pull that particular consent item and all the other items that were with it until after I had done the presentation on the whole service and pilot program and what it was about. So don't be like me, like make sure that the board either knows what's coming their way or that they you have a consent separate consent item outside of that agenda item. So I gave the presentation, it went okay. And I'm kind of ready for them to say, you know, this sounds like a great idea. Let's go move along with the meeting. But 
that didn't happen. They had some questions. They had some good questions. So the first question I got was, is this dish service company unionized? Next question is, won't these trucks make more pollution? Then they asked, is the water recycled? Are the chemicals they use harmful? Are these trays made in America? Why not use hard plastic? And I actually had a sample tray that they passed around. And one of them said, this tray is just too heavy. So I know now the answer to these questions, you know, Dish Joy uses clean diesel and hybrid trucks. Of course, the cleaning process is done very environmentally sound way. So basically for walking in there naively thinking they wouldn't ask the hard questions, I got what I deserved. Uh, so of doing this, be prepared. Uh, in the end, of course, they approved in their final comments. Of course, they said that they thought it was a good idea as well. So now the team was in place. We worked with maintenance and custodial to get Dish Joy access to our kitchens. They didn't leave anything outside. They have a key. They go into our kitchen and leave the tray and utensils there. This is how they do it with their corporate accounts. So we're not any different. Uh, the administrators prepped and scheduled assemblies with their students. We spoke to the union since it didn't really add or take away any work from their staff. They were fine with it. Uh, we spoke to our child nutrition staff. The trays are heavier. Uh, and very importantly, uh, these, these trays come on low, low dollies. If they need to pick these things up, they're very heavy. They have to do it in pairs. Uh, we showed them, we, we really made sure they were very cognizant about the weight here so there would be no injuries. That was probably the main concern there. We showed them how to load the condiment dispensers and how to change the condiment bags. So everyone really came together. Uh, the people from our district, the vendors, the servicers, they all helped so much. Rolling out 10 sites was not always smooth, but everybody was very accommodating because I think that they all very much believed in this project. So here you can see the tray bin and dolly. It's on the bottom left side of the, the picture on the left. Uh, usually stacked three high, they come covered in plastic and they get delivered right into the cafeteria or kitchen. You can see some of the compostable trays also in this uh, picture. That picture was taken on a Wednesday because we give the uh, kinders compostable trays because they tend to wander off with their parents, even though they shouldn't be. Uh, so we make sure they don't wander away with our trays as well. And on the right side, you see our condiment utensil and pumps. So before every school rollout, there's school assemblies. Uh, ben from CEH has presented at some of these and Stephanie, the FUSD recycling coordinator has done the rest. Uh, in the presentation, there's a buildup about the importance of waste reduction. And then there's this really great moment where Stephanie mentions that this school site has been picked to use reusables and the kids, they cheer and they clap and it's really great to see. So everyone's prepared on the first day, we, use, we begin their lunch service and we notice that the kids tend to load their plates up on this day. They really go to the salad bar, take one of everything. They wanna take one fork, one spoon, even if they don't need it. And the food does look much more appealing. I think that's one of the things that really, really stuck with me. And the kids will readily say that as well. So we already had the trash sorting in place for after they're done, uh, they scrape into the compost and dispose into one of the recycle bins or trash bins. Uh, you can see here, we actually have the utensils and trays after the, uh, the trash cans. Maybe we'll move it before, as Dr. Wilson mentioned. Uh, so the overall reaction is really positive. Uh, the administrators are happy, the custodian, they love it. Uh, the staff thinks it's good. Uh, of course, the custodian doesn't have to haul nearly as much waste and that's it. I mean, we've successfully navigated the whole process here. Every school is generally the same with our rollouts, the same kind of pattern. Uh, but of course, doing the first one is always the hardest. So looking forward, uh, we, we're thinking about some milk dispensers. Maybe we can incorporate those cups and get some reusable bowls as well. And then if we can dream, uh, maybe building our own central kitchen with a large industrial dishwasher as well. So that is it. Thank you. Thank you so much to both Johannes and Dr. Kitty for your amazing presentations today. Thank you as well to Cafeteria Culture for helping us put on this presentation and Jenny Davis as well. Um, I'd also like to thank Sue Chang. Uh, she's also a um, member here at CEH for being an alternative host. Uh, with that, we'll now turn it over to the Q&A session. So for our first question, um, we have a question for Dr. Katie. So Dr. Kitty, you are leading the Urban School Food Alliance in such a visionary direction. Um, 
how can folks in large and small districts get started on pass packaging reduction? Is there a specific type of plastic packaging that is a good starting place to tackle? Yeah, I think, like I said in my presentation, the individually wrapped items, we're so used to those. And during COVID, of course, we used a lot of it just simply because we were passing food out, out in the parking lot. But I think to really begin to think about uh, that volume buying, how do you buy in bulk? Can you buy larger cases? It might be more cost effective to buy larger cases as well. Um, and then thinking about how do you make sure that if a case isn't completely used, how do you still that standard operating procedure, how do you make sure that that case gets completely used so there's no waste in food as well once it's been opened? But I think all size districts can do this. I guess my, my district was 1700. We came together uh, in Western Wisconsin with all our tiny little rural districts and we started writing specifications into our bids and letting the vendors know we were going to do it to start reducing the amount of plastic. So working together, finding those partnerships, and then really thinking, go back to that menu, get that cycle menu going so that you're repeating items to use those things, and then begin to think about, and you can start really small. Where do you start to buy in bulk? And just start very small uh, on one or two items to get that rolling. Thank you so much. All right, our next question is for Johannes. The changes you have made in your school district have been amazing. How can folks in medium and smaller districts get started on switching to reusables? So I think that, you know, securing the funding is probably the primary concern uh, with this. So, and like I said in the presentation, there are people willing to help. There's organizations, there's a city, uh, there's a county, there's the state, um, there are grants. That's how I would advise going about it and starting small uh, and seeing, you know, taking your time and starting small, uh, letting everybody know, and then you'll probably be surprised how many people want to get involved. Thank you. All right, back to Dr. Katie. Are there any unique obstacles to using volume buying power that smaller school districts face in comparison to larger school districts and how can they overcome these obstacles? Well, I think, you know, there's an obstacle in anything, especially when you make change. I think Johanna said it really nicely is that people sometimes are afraid of change and, and they get panicked about what that change is going to look like. Um, so I, I don't know. I, I People can say, well, storage. OK, well, but a case of individually wrapped might even be bigger than a case of bulk. So you have to start thinking through. And you again, you have to talk to the people that you're working with. I love Johanna's talking about his staff. Um, working with them on those trays and thinking about how do you do this? They are heavy. Here are some solutions to that. Some of the things we did in our district is we we made sure everybody had their own cart. I got so tired of people saying to me, well, but there's things on that cart. I can't use a cart. Yet we gave everybody their own cart so that they could have that cart. It was theirs. You know, and, and I think about even those four ounce plastic cups I talked about. We put a lid on it a lot of times. Okay, if you don't want to get rid of the plastic cups right away, could you just get rid of the lid to start with? See if it works. So I think obstacles sometimes are only within our own realm and we have to step over that obstacle and, and do some brainstorming with your staff. You'd be surprised how great my school nutrition teams were when I'd sit them in a circle and say, here's the problem we want to solve. What are your ideas? And it was amazing how many of them had fabulous ideas to solve some of those obstacles. Thank you so much. All right, the next question is for Johannes. We're curious if you've looked at your waste hauling bill and if there's been any reduction. Um, if not, do you think the savings could further reduce the increased cost of reusables? Yes, uh, they certainly have reduced. Uh, I think, you know, we, we've kind of not finished rolling everything out yet, uh, but for this school year, we've reduced by, I believe it's three tons. So a little over 6,000 pounds of waste, compostable waste in this case too. Uh, in California, at least in our school district, that, that's, that price or the, the waste hauling is paid by the school district and not by our fund. Uh, so we didn't actually realize any of that uh, for ourselves. That's, that's with them. That's just a benefit from them too. So that's how I dealt with financially. But if, if you have a different situation in your school district, then uh, it certainly will help a lot. And the custodians are very happy. Thank you. All right, this question can be tossed to both Johannes and Dr. Katie. 
have you dealt with resistant food service directors? So basically, how do you have, um, what would you do in this situation where there are certain folks within the school district who are not quite as on board with switching to reusables? Jonas, you want to start that one? Yeah, you know, okay. it's it's funny. I didn't, besides the board meeting, and I, I think the board was all on board with it, uh, they, I didn't really face any of that. I mean, from what I heard, you know, one of the principals said that, you know, someone said she was crazy to start this. Nobody came directly to me with that. We started small. Um, it, it, I think the results were kind of undeniable. And, and it was really, you know, it really did change the look and, and, you know, things are changing kind of greatly here in California. And I think a lot of people realize that. And I think too, when you want to make change again, the education, educate, 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 talk to people ahead of time, find out who's going to champion the PTA, the PTO, they can help champion this. You might have an ag department and the students in FFA might champion this. So there are a lot of different groups that will champion this for you. I know the director in Miami, she's retired now, but when she started this removing of the straw, there were even teachers that said, oh, ick, we don't want to drink out of the milk carton without a straw. And so there was this whole issue. So what she did, she was brilliant. She and her team went at this with beautiful pictures of dolphins in the ocean and what they were doing to help the dolphin and the damage that these straws could do to dolphins if they got, you know, so she did it in a different mindset. And um, you just have to fight. There will be naysayers somewhere along the line if you want to make change, no matter what the change is. But you have to find a way. The same thing in my district when I was a director, everybody said when I did salad bars and let everybody serve their own and got rid of all the little plastic cups and all that, there's going to be all this spillage. They're going to have it all over the place. And I'm with Johannes. They didn't spill anything. The kindergarten kids did fine. We did a kindergarten training the first day of school with a tray with some applesauce in it before lunch. And they were good. They knew how to do it because they'd been in restaurants that already do this kind of thing. So um, I just think you have to find your champions and keep moving forward. You know, for, for, for us too, I just see that Stephanie wrote this in the chat. Stephanie Willis is our recycling coordinator here. The students were a huge part of this too. Uh, they yeah. started passing resolutions. They are the ones that really want this and they get excited about this and they're driving this to a huge degree for us. Thank you both so much for that. All right, our next question is for Johannes. Um, in your opinion, what has been the biggest obstacle to overcome when moving towards reusables? Yeah, I, I see this in some of the question and answers as well about costs. Uh, and that's that's the biggest obstacle uh, for us, you know, with, with these grants and, you know, getting the, the, the funding from other sources just to sustain it. You know, we don't want to have to roll this out and then have to take it back later. Uh, we want to keep going with this. We want to expand one day. We want to, you know, have a dishwasher, maybe use bond program money to, to do that. And, and, you know, as Dr. Wilson says, it's, you know, if people are into this idea, if we do have champions, then those kind of big scale projects, uh, they can help, they can get done. Great, thank you. And then um, as one last question, I'll pose this both to Johannes and Dr. Katie. Um, in your work, what has been your proudest achievement? Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> I think in this realm, I, I just do think that the Urban School Food Alliance, I, I'm just so honored to be um, working with them and be the executive director of this organization because, and we do have 19 districts now, Jenny, I'm super excited. Fairfax County, Virginia just joined. So uh, I will tell you that these are the movers and shakers in the industry. They they care passionately about their communities, about the kids they're serving, about their way they're doing business. Um, they're watching pennies, literally down to the penny. We all know in school food service, that's what it's all about. Uh, so really one of my proudest achievements is that they're, they care about this. They care about this topic. They care about food waste. They care about good nutrition standards. And so it's it's wonderful to bring these ideas to them. And we share best practices. So you can go to our website and all the best practices are free of charge. You just go look at the PowerPoints that they've put together for best practices. And so when they begin to think these kinds of things through, and then they together collectively can really make a difference because of their sheer volume and they want to change something, they move forward on doing it. So really one of my proudest uh, things is, is really taking these kind of topics on 
and putting them in the forefront and saying, all right, what are we going to do about this? And then being able to share what the success stories that we have. Uh, so for me, you know, with this, the proudest accomplishment is how it folds into the bigger picture. And you mentioned at the beginning of this that uh, Fremont Unified is working with uh, the Nutrition Policy Institute to do a plate waste study and to basically find out that, that, you know, mysterious everlasting question, how do we get students to eat more of what they take uh, of this nutrition? You know, we are, as Dr. Wilson said, the biggest restaurant in town, and we do want them to eat these whole grains. We want them to eat these fresh fruits and vegetables and how it folds into that. You heard me mention too in the presentation that the food really does look better on these trays. It's better than on some sad, you know, molded fiber uh, tray with some sad little sport kit uh, that ends up flying around old campus. So how to get that, you know, how to improve that, how to improve their nutrition, that's what we do. Uh, and uh, that's most, the thing that makes me most proud about, you know, starting these reusables as well. All right, with that, thank you both so, so much for your time. You are both, truly inspiring in this field. And I think I speak with everyone here when I say that it's been an honor to hear from you, to hear your insights, to hear your learnings. And we want to help you continue this fight to move forward and help to bring um, reduced plastic packaging in school cafeterias. Uh, as a little housekeeping reminder, there will be a recorded um, version of this presentation sent out to all um, attendees to this webinar, so you'll receive an email that will have a link to this recorded webinar session um, on the CEH's website. And um, I think you can also access the chat and the questions as well. So thank you to everyone for attending. Thank you again to our speakers. Um, and I hope everyone has a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you, Bella and uh, Center for Environmental Health for doing a lovely job facilitating and organizing the webinar. Thank you, everybody. Thanks. Thank you all.